Well, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening service uh, here at Frizzleburg Bible Church, and we're glad that you've come to be with us. Uh, we're going to, uh, tonight, continue our series on walking with the Lord, and tonight uh, our discussion will be about uh, a contrast of two different individuals. But before we get to Eli and Samuel, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne, and we're so thankful, Lord, for this opportunity that you've given to us to look into your word, Lord, to be encouraged that we need to have a strong and healthy relationship with you, that, Lord, our goal is to, to learn to hear your voice and to walk with you in every single way that you have determined for us to walk. Lord, I pray that you'll give us your mind and your understanding as we learn to walk with you. Lord, may we say, with Samuel, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to contrast two people today. I mean, originally I would say that this is Samuel walking with the Lord, because obviously the opposite of that is Eli, who, though doing some good things, um, according to what you're going to read here, was not an individual who truly allowed God to be his main goal. And so he did not walk with God. The, the title of this message is Speak, Lord, for Thy Servant Hears. And if you wanted to have a subtitle, I would say it's Doing That Which Is In The Heart and Mind of God. Doing That Which Is In The Heart and Mind of God. We all need to get to the place to where we can say, Speak, Lord, Your Servant Hears. I'm often amazed by people like Elijah, which we'll probably get to at some point in this series, but I'm often amazed by them on the basis that I, 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 it's just amazing to me to see a man who, who can say that this is what God says. And the Bible doesn't come right out and say that he talked to God about it, though I'm positive that he did. But I'm thinking along the lines of someone who learns to listen to God to such an extent that they are truly walking with God, and thus they have the mind of God in every situation. They have the heart of God in every situation. That's what I want to be. That's what I strive to be. That's what my desire is. I want to be a person that says to God, Speak, Lord, I'm listening. And, and I think that as we look at the contrast of Eli, who knew what God wanted, but instead catered to his family and to what they wanted. And the end result was that he ended up failing miserably. So let's look at the passage. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 27 to 36 tonight. Verses 27 to 36. Uh, and if you, if, if you look at this passage, you, you see very easily, starting from the beginning, um, that a, verse 27 says, And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto him unto and did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? In other words, you get to have a piece of it. Uh, and don't muzzle the ox uh, they, as they bring the offerings per, certain portions of it will be burnt so on and, and the priest would get to keep the rest but if you remember the story of Eli his sons would take a big meat hook and they'd stick it in there and grab what they wanted and not listen to what God said they were supposed to do they weren't following God's procedures um, so the, the, the whole story here is a man of God comes and speaking on God's behalf he begins to say some things to, to Eli. We're going to look at verse 29 in a moment to answer one of our questions. So let me ask our first question, as we've been doing with this, since this is set up as a Bible study in which we think about things and, and I steer you in a certain direction. My first question is, what did God say towards Israel, um, the priesthood, if you want to call it that, and, and thus, since we are a royal priesthood, us, in verse 30. What did God say towards Israel and us in verse 30? It says, Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said, indeed, 
that thy house and the house of thy father, what's those next couple words? Say it with me. Should walk before me forever. Listen, God wants us to walk with him. I think that's been the theme of the entire series that we've been doing, is that God's desire, God's built in us a desire to walk with him, to have him by our side and guiding our every step. And, and so God wants us to enjoy the blessings of walking with him. He wants us to walk along with him. He wants us, and he designed us so that they could walk before God forever. So what was the purpose of Eli and of any other priest, of you and me, since not pastor, no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the priesthood that is the body of Christ. What did God desire us to do? That's right. To walk before God forever. Now let me ask you this, question number two. Even though God said this, we do not always choose to do what he designed us to do. So, the question would be, what does he want us to remember that's also written in verse 30? So if you look at verse 30, the second part, part B, it says, But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. This should not be taken too lightly, folks. God says, if you honor me, I will honor you. He also says, if you despise me, I will look at you as a small thing. It reminds me of Jesus later on in his ministry, years down the road from this Samuel story, when he tells you, if you deny me, I will deny you. If you call on me, you recognize me, you praise me, I will also honor you. So this is a theme of God throughout the scripture. And I, I don't think that we need to take this and say, oh, well, look at that person and what's happening in their life. God's not honoring them. That's not what this is about. But in our personal walk and relationship with God, folks, we, we need to get to the place to where we recognize that if I'm saying, speak, Lord, I want to hear you. I'm listening. I want to do what you say. Then I not only receive blessings, but I get the honor that comes from actually doing what God says. You see, when I do my own thing, when, when I do things my way, I bring to myself a shrinking attitude in life. My goal should be always Lord, I want to hear you. I want to do your thing. I want to honor you. Because when I do the opposite, I lose every time. So then, question number three. What was God's problem with Eli? And these are found in verse 29. So that's why I told you we'd come back there in a second. What was God's problem with Eli? What did this uh, prophet that comes in tell him? Verse 29. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering. Listen, when I think about this, this is like the idea of, of not valuing the things that were important to God, the sacrifice, the offering. In the modern day, we have similar quotations in Corinthians about taking of the Lord's Supper, okay, as a, as a for instance. And there are other things in, in, in like throughout the history like the, the, the name of God. Why do you take these things so lightly? Okay, what do you value most? And this is what he was telling Eli. Why do you not care? Now, I want you to think about some ways that we take things too lightly when it comes to walking with God. The first way that I would mention is in our prayer time. I think that we Christians struggle to have consistent praise, discussion, talk time with God. We like the, the idea of sitting down and having our prayer times at meals and such. And we also like the idea of, of um, uh, praying our, our grocery list of wants or needs or helps, right? But we struggle to have worship time where it's just me and God communicating. I dare say that the majority of time when we sit down as Christians to read the Bible, 
that our attitude isn't one of, or should I say our prayer life isn't one of, Lord, I'm going to spend the next couple minutes of prayer because I want to open this conversation with you and I need you to guide me into all truth as I study the Word of God today. Now, I'm not trying to judge with that statement. I'm just telling you that there's a major weakness within Christianity because we kick at, we're light with, we don't value the way we should the things of God. Prayer time. Reading of Scripture. Okay? Uh, you know, we can spend hours a day watching TV or other such thing, but to study the Word of God and to get serious about trying to figure out a question or study something out for ourselves, I think in a lot of ways is very hard for the average Christian. Well, let's not kick against those anymore. I want to walk with God. I want to be constantly living the attitude of our second part in the contrast, Samuel, where I'm saying, Lord, speak. Because I'm listening. I want to hear. I want your guidance. That's the key to our walk today. Okay? So the first thing that God says to Eli that I find that you're missing is you kick at the things given to God, the sacrifices and offerings that God commanded for you to do. Continue, <coughs> excuse me, continue on. Uh, in, in the second part, and honor thy sons above me. Now listen, this is pretty empty. God says you have other things that are more important than God. You honored your family above God. Folks, I want to tell you something. There are so many different things that matter so much to all of us that we allow to cloud out, speak Lord, because I'm listening. You know, I've seen people who have had a major stand based on the Word of God, and the moment their family member gets stuck in this issue, their, their immediate struggle is to, to step away from the sand. And I, I don't want to mention specific things because I don't want you to feel like I'm talking to you because I'm not. What I want you to see, though, is that our goal is to stand true no matter what. To be the right person that follows God's Word and is hearing God, not our own ideas, not our own traditions, not our own path but to care most about God. Keep that as prominent. In this case, Eli was more worried about his sons. And I want to point out to you in the end that did he save them by doing that? Or did he allow them to actually head towards their own destruction? So the honest answer is, honor God, not the family or others. Okay, it goes on and says, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. In essence, God says, you took for yourself rather than seeing it for God. Listen, God wants us to have this idea of he walked in his own way. No, he doesn't. That's what Eli did. God wants us to have the idea of what? Speak, Lord, for your servant ears. I'm listening. I'm watching. I'm looking. I'm reading. I'm praying. But that was not the attitude of Eli. So then, our next question is, and this will take us from verse 31 to 34, what happened because Eli did not walk with God? What was the end result? And a small note here, as I mentioned to you, if you look at chapter 4, verse 18, this won't be in our passage here, we're not going to read it, but a small note that should be at the end of this, he also died. The first part in verse 31. Okay, verse 31 tells us, Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. Look at the end of verse 32. It says, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. Look at verse 30, 33. And the man of thine whom I shall cut, not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. So in verse 31, 32, and 33, God says what? He's going to cut off. His family's done. He's going to lose everything that he cherished. In fact, his legacy will be ruined. Folks, I want you to understand that if we live what God wants us to, speak, Lord, thy servant hears. I want to walk with you, God. I'm going to go your way. I'm going to have your mind and your heart. If we do that, 
We bring to ourselves a great legacy because we're allowing God to bring that legacy for us. But folks, if we're like Eli and we're worried about protecting our own and about keeping our own and setting our own and then bringing to ourselves, the end result is we lose. So God's first thing was, I'll cut off the arm, the arm of the, thy father's house, and no more of your old men will be alive. You won't have anybody else to lead. Okay? And then in verse 32, we have a second thing. Okay? Verse 32 says, And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel. Now, this is pretty big to me, because this is not just a loss of blessings for you, but you will see that the things of God will be used by those that are God's enemy. And you will recognize it was your fault. This is a heavy one, I think. Because sometimes I think we accidentally get ourselves into this place where we're not paying attention to God. We're not speak, Lord, thy servant hears. And we're going the wrong direction and we find ourselves making decisions that are against what God wants. And later on, we struggle in our life. How do I get back there? Because I've ruined so many things and whatever. And we allow this guilt and this weight to so heavily eat us. That is not God's way, folks. Understand this. God loves you and he wants to help you. There is a loss of blessings, not just for you, but for others associated with you when you make a mistake. But God loves you and he wants us to be Samuels. And it's as simple as you getting to the place where you'll say to God, Speak, Lord, for thy servant ears. I can't help but think that a few chapters later, we have Samuel laying down in the bed, and God calling his name, and Samuel going to Eli, and Eli telling him to go back to bed over and over, and so on. And the entire time, there is no Eli who says, let me sit up in bed and talk to God because I'm concerned about what he might be calling Samuel for. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Eli could have easily, with these warnings and other such warnings, backed up and said, let's get it right. Let's plead with God. Let's fix this thing. But because he didn't, he lost blessings not only for himself, but for the people that surrounded him. Folks, I want to tell you this. God allowed the Ark of the Covenant to be stolen because of his and his son's choices. And Eli knew this was bad. You can fix this if you're in that situation. Just go right to God right now and tell him, Lord, I know that I've been a little hard towards you or I'm mad at you or I'm upset with you, but I want you to know that I want to get back to this place where I say it, speak, because I'm listening. The third thing that I see is in verse 33 and 34, and we've already mentioned it, and it's the early death of his sons. In verse 34 that we didn't read yet, it says, And this shall be a sign unto thee, that thou shalt come un upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Now if you were to look at this story and check it out, you'd find out that what happened is that they took the Ark of the Covenant to help the people in a battle against the Philistines. The Philistines came, they lost the Ark of the Covenant, they also... Um, had these two sons and many other people die. Again, the sins just contacted right into other people and caused trouble for others as well. And so, how well did it work? Not very well. So in verse 35, our fifth question, what did God say he would do to replace Eli? This is very important. He says, and I will raise me up a faithful priest. A faithful priest. Do you see that in the royal priesthood that all of us that know Jesus Christ as personal Savior and believe belong? That in that royal priesthood, we are supposed to be faithful. We're supposed to be ones who walk according to God's heart and mind. The problem is, we don't. We struggle. What did God say in this verse 35? that the faithful priest would do, okay? What did God say that the faithful priest would do? Look, look at the end of the verse here, the second part. 
That shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. So what's the first thing he says? He will do what God cares about. Now you think about some of the things, and we'll talk about this in a minute as one of our questions, but you think about some of the things that Samuel did. How faithful was he? And, and in a moment we'll answer a question further about this. But doing that which is in the heart and mind of God. And I will build him a sure house. Um, who has a great legacy? Now I'm not telling you that Samuel's sons were perfect. In fact, they, they say, and the Bible says that because of some weaknesses within the son that the children of Israel claimed the need to, um, uh, to have a king before God was ready. I've always told you that I believe that David was always originally chosen as the first one, that because the people sinned and chose to reject God, they wanted a king, they got Saul, and that God still allowed Saul to have a setup to where in giving through the David and Goliath setup, um, and to Goliath, one of his daughter, he ended up in a position where he could have been the, the starting line, but not the line. The line had to be from Judah. But Saul could have been the starting line, the father-in-law of the true king of Israel that would then be the type and picture of the future king, Jesus Christ. Could have all been done then. But that's beside the point right now. I want you to see that he has a sure uh, house. When people thought of Samuel being involved in things, if you read the rest of the books of Samuel, I promise you, regardless of whatever you see anywhere else that anybody else is doing, what is he doing? His house is sure. His faith is firm. His stand is right. And his decisions are always doing what God asks him to do even down to the brokenheartedness and the feeling like he was a failure because they wanted the king before God was ready to give him one. Folks, I'm just going to tell you, that's what I want to be. And I hope that's what you want to be as you walk with God. So a sure house. And the third thing you see right there, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. He will walk before my anointed. Now think about this. I believe that's a twofold promise. He'll walk before the king, but he'll walk before the ultimate king forever, Jesus Christ. Folks, again, I want to be that man. And I trust that that's your desire to walk before God in that way. The fourth one that you could see under this question number six, what did God say uh, that the, this faithful priest would do? Look at verse 36, and it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. In other words, Eli was told, Your family will be removed from any position within the setup, and you'll beg Samuel for help from the Lord. So, let me ask you this. Do you love God, care about God, know God well enough that you're like a married couple with God to where when God wants something, you already know what it is and you can complete it. When people ask me, would my wife like to be a part of something? I can tell you from the first question which way the answer is. When the people say, um, would your wife like this? I might still ask her, but it's only because I don't want to make a mistake. But the honest truth is, I pretty much know whether she wants that or whether she doesn't. Think about how we ought to be with God. How well do we walk with God? So let me ask you this. Who is the faithful priest? Well, obviously the book then goes, chapter 3, chapter 4, and so on. And what we're setting up is the priest who will say, what? Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. Which is actually right there in our passage not our passage tonight, but in the future. So what is Samuel known for? Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears, which is in chapter 4. And uh, let's see. I can't remember where I was looking at it, but I had it right in front of me. Um, chapter 4 is where the failure is. Sorry. It's chapter, uh, chapter 3. I lost myself here. 
Um, same with go lie down it shall be if thou call thee and thou shalt say speak Lord for thy servant here so Eli tells him in verse 9 of chapter 3 uh, and so and the Lord came unto Samuel in verse 10 and he called as at other times Samuel Samuel then Samuel answered speak for thy servant here that's what we ought to be so how faithful did he serve God with his whole life well think of his ministry to Saul Think of the, the way that he had to deal with Saul when Saul did a small little thing in the eyes of man. He made a sacrifice when God said he shouldn't sacrifice, when God told him to wait. How, how about in choosing David? You know, all these tall men of stature and great men of war and so on and so forth, they're out fighting in the army and everything. And when, when Samuel brings through the brothers of David, he keeps saying, surely this is the one, surely this is the one. And God says, mm -mm. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. But the only way you hear that, folks, is, is if you're saying with your life, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. Many battles were won. Since, say, for instance, chapter 7 against the Philistines, where a, a great storm came in because Samuel prayed. Folks, I want to tell you that this man, over and over and over again, exemplified the idea that, Lord, I'm going to be where you want me to be, I'm going to do what you want me to do, and I'm going to say what you want me to say. Speak. I'm listening. And I want to ask you, how does this apply to you and me? Well, I think very simply, very easily, you and I should say to ourselves, we want to be those people who say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant ears. We want to be a person who hears God's voice in every single thing. I can't tell you the countless times that I've ran ahead of God and done something, maybe even that was not important or not big at all, and didn't ask God, and ended up regretting it later. And I'm talking from simple things, like I've given you stories before, like being in the Boston area and needing to call somebody, and, and manipulating my way to run since we weren't allowed to use the phones in ensemble to run to a phone booth only to find out when I got back that the individuals were going to dial any number I wanted and, and have me sit there and talk to that individual with them and enjoy getting to know my family and I could have done the entire thing a different way but I ran ahead of God. Folks, we need to learn to walk with God to say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant ears. Speak, Lord, for thy servant ears. Speak, Lord, for thy servant ears. I am but a child, yet thou hast called my name. There must be a special task for me to claim. Speak, Lord, tell me all thy will. Speak, Lord, in a voice so still. Though the task be great, or though the task be small, I will trust in thee alone and give my all. I don't ask for riches, I don't ask for fame, I don't ask that honor be heaped upon my name. I only ask thy presence to ever be the same. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. Come, Lord, take me by the... Let me start that verse again. Come, Lord, take me by the hand. Come, Lord, teach a child to stand. Show me where to go and tell me what to say. Give my word to light my path and point the way. Yes, Lord, thy command is heard. Yes, Lord, I obey thy word. Now I feel thy power, and now I see thy plan. Mold me as a useful vessel in thy hand. 
I don't ask for riches. I don't ask for fame. I don't ask that honor be heaped upon my name. I only ask thy presence to ever be the same. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. Let's close our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne as people who desire to truly have what you've promised to us, the ability to walk with God. And Lord, I, I pray that you forgive our weaknesses, our times of being distracted and running off the path, our times of not being able to see your hand and doubting our various struggles that we have. And Lord, I pray you bring us back to a place where we're willing to just sit right there and, and ask, Lord, what do you want? How do you want it? Speak, Lord, because I'm listening. Lord, I pray that you would make us a people that in this revival time, this time of renewal, this time of less distractions and more opportunity to spend with you, that you would cause each of us to come before your throne and to have a special time and relationship building where we learn to truly hear the voice of God and do his heart and his mind. And I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and what it means for each of us. Draw us to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that you enjoyed this service and I hope that it touches your heart and I hope that you will with me say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. Hope to see you Sunday. Bye.